And now for our dinosaur of the day, Corythosaurus, which is requested from Brenna via Facebook. So thanks, Brenna. Corythosaurus is a hadrosaur or duck-billed dinosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in North America. Fossils have been found, I believe, only in southern Alberta, Canada. So Corythosaurus may have only lived in one small area. Its name means helmet lizard. The type species is Corythosaurus cassuarius. And so the name Corythosaurus is Greek for helmeted lizard, and the name Cassuarius comes from the cassuary bird, which is a small, but I believe ranked like the most vicious bird that's currently living. People have to wear riot gear when they're around because they're so territorial and they can be very vicious. And this is because Corythosaurus had some similarities with cassowaries. So Corythosaurus had an estimated length of nine meters or 30 feet, and its skull, including the crest, it has a crest on top of its head, part of the helmet look, was about 71 centimeters or 28 inches tall. It weighed maybe between three to five tons. It was first described in 1914 by Barnum Brown. Brown found the holotype specimen in 1911, though there are many complete specimens now, and the holotype's actually missing the last part of its tail and part of its forelimbs, but what's interesting is this holotype had impressions of scales. So again, Corythosaurus had crests that looked like the crests of a cassowary, and the crests may have been used for vocalization because scientists think it could have amplified sound. The holotype specimen is now in the American Museum of Natural History, along with a second specimen that Brown and Peter Kazin found in 1914, and they're put in their, quote, original death poses, meaning the way they were found in the ground. Brown actually described the second specimen in 1916 and gave a more detailed description of Corythosaurus. Also, Charles H. Sternberg found two well-preserved specimens in 1912, but unfortunately they were lost in 1916 while they're being shipped to the paleontologist Arthur Smith Woodward in the UK. This is during World War I and the ship was sunk by a German merchant raider. More than 20 Corythosaurus skulls have been found, and there used to be seven different Corythosaurus species. In addition to Cassuarius, there was Bicristatus, Brevicristatus, Excavatus, Frontalis, and Intermedius. But in 1975, Peter Dodson studied all of these species and found that the different sizes and shapes may have actually been due to gender and age, so now only one species is recognized, Cassuarius. Some studies, however, say that Corythosaurus intermedius is its own species because it lived slightly later than Corythosaurus cassuarius, and it's slightly different. Brown originally classified Corythosaurus as part of the family Trachodontidae, which is now Hadrosauridae, but then he found that it was possibly an ancestor to Hippocrosaurus, which is it's very similar except for its development of vertebrae and limb proportions. So now Corythosaurus is part of a family called Lambosaurinae, which have similar skulls and crests, and I'll get into a little more details on that family in a little bit. The holotype specimen was a carcass that had floated up on a beach. There were shells and water-worn bones and a turtle preserved near it. Scientists used to think that Corythosaurus lived in water because it also seemingly had webbed hands and feet. But it turned out these webs were actually deflated padding, which is seen on some modern mammals. But at the time, the theory was that they could swim in deep water and use their crest to store air. However, Corythosaurus probably lived in woodland forests, and they may have visited swampy areas. They were probably bipedal, and they had short arms and a long tail, and they may have gone on all fours to eat low-lying plants. They were probably picky about what they ate maybe juicy fruits and young leaves, and scientists think that because they have this narrow beak. It's a toothless beak with hundreds of cheek teeth, and they would have used their beaks to eat soft vegetation. There's been some debate over what they ate. One Corythosaurus that was preserved was found with what's thought to be its last meal in its chest cavity, so they found remains of conifer needles, seeds, twigs, and fruits. But some scientists aren't convinced that this is the type of things it ate. Corythosaurus had a great sense of hearing, and it was probably cathemeral. The reason scientists think that it was cathemeral is based on these bony circles, these rings that are found in many reptiles, birds, and dinosaurs that probably help their pupils adjust, but it's not entirely clear what it's for, I don't believe. Because Corythosaurus was probably cathemeral, it may have eaten small amounts of food at a time to digest quickly. And also being cathemeral, this would have made it easier to live alongside other herbivores that were either diurnal or nocturnal, active only during the day or active only at night. 
Corythosaurus was probably a herding animal, they may have gone to higher ground to reproduce. Predators may have included Albertosaurus or Tyrannosaurus or Trudon, especially to juvenile Corythosaurus. The crest on top of its head had extended tubes that were these complex nasal passages, and its head crest is hollow, which is why it's classified in the subfamily Lambiosaurine. There's a few uh, ideas on what the crest would have been used for. It may have been used to call out warnings or let others know, hey, there's food nearby, or to attract mates. And if the crest was used for display, its hollowness may have helped reduce the weight of the crest. Another Lambiosaurine includes Parasaurolophus, to give an idea of the types of dinosaurs in this group. Males had larger crests than females, and in general, the size and shape of the crest vary based on gender and age. Scientists think that it made loud, low-pitched sounds like a trombone or a wind or other type of brass instrument. And they also think that Corythosaurus started growing its crest when it reached half the size of an adult. Ohio University did a CT scan in 2008 that found Corythosaurus had a delicate inner ear and could hear low-frequency sounds. Corythosaurus also, unfortunately, had no real defense mechanisms. But Scott Persons from the University of Alberta found that while Corythosaurus had smaller strides than Tyrannosaurids, they had a lot more endurance. So on long pursuits, they would have lasted longer. Again, the holotype specimen of Corythosaurus had skin impressions. And this is actually fairly com well, maybe not common, but it occurs more with hadrosaurs than other types of dinosaurs. And Matt Davis from Yale University suggested that the reason for this is because hadrosaurs may have had tougher textures compared to other dinosaurs. And he came to this conclusion when he reviewed reports on dinosaur skins from 1841 through the present and found that in 180 reports, 46% of the fossils with skin were hadrosaurs. He also looked at data from 343 dinosaurs from the Hell Creek Formation, and 20 of the 22 dinosaurs with skin fossils were hadrosaurs, which is 91%. The group Hadrosauridae, the duck-billed dinosaurs, were common herbivores from the Cretaceous, whose fossils have been found in Asia, Europe, and North America. They're descendants of Iguanodontian dinosaurs, and they had a similar body layout. Hadrosaurids were the first dinosaur family identified in North America based on fossil teeth found between 1855 and 1856. And Joseph Leedy studied the teeth and named the genera Trachodon and Thespesius, though Trachodon's no longer considered a valid genus because it was found that it also included ceratopsids and it was too different. In 1858, scientists associated the teeth of the hadrosaur teeth with Hadrosaurus falci, named after William Parker Falk, and eventually, they found a few more parts to this Hadrosaurus in New Jersey, and actually now that specimen is fondly referred to as Hattie, and we talked about Hattie in a previous episode. If you go to Haddonfield, New Jersey, you can see the spot, which is actually just at the end of a suburban street where the bones were found, the site. And then you can see the fossil on display at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University in Philadelphia. Edward Drinker Cope first used the name Hadrosauridae in 1869, and just to go back to Hadrosaurus having fossilized skin, there was one nearly complete specimen found in 1999 in the Hell Creek Formation, which is nicknamed Dakota, and scientists were able to calculate its muscle mass because it was so complete, and it had fossilized skin, ligaments, tendons, and even some internal organs. There's two subfamilies in Hadrosauridae. There's the Lambiosaurines, which have hollow crests, and Saurolophines, which have solid crests. And actually, before 2010, most hadrosaurids were classified as saurolophines. Hadrosaurs had lots of teeth in the back of their mouth to chew up the food, which is probably what made their group as a whole very successful compared to sauropods in the same time period. Mark Pernell found in 2009 that hadrosaurs had a hinge between its upper jaws and skull, and the upper jaw pushed outwards and sideways when chewing while the lower jaw slid against the upper teeth. Vincent Williams, Paul Barrett, and Mark Pernell found in 2009 that hadrosaurids probably ate horsetails and low-lying vegetation based on how they chewed instead of twigs or stems. But this contradicts the finding of the hadrosaur with its last meal in its stomach, so this is up for debate. However, there have been some coprolites found that show that hadrosaurs may have eaten rotting wood which would have had fungi and some kind of nutritious invertebrates. 